Hi, I'm Reverend Zach. And I'm Francis. And welcome to this movie was a... Wait, wait. Was? Is? Was a hot dog. Welcome to this movie was a hot dog. A podcast where me and my brother, Francis over here, watch a bad movie critically, financially, or otherwise. Then we review it, break it down, and tell you what we think. And welcome to our 50th episode extravaganza. Yay! Yeah, all right. <laughs> and this week, for our 50th episode, me and my brother watched a movie that is very near and dear to our hearts. The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. And you have to yell it because it has an exclamation point. <laughs> oh, does it? I didn't know yeah. that an exclamation point. But this movie is just out there. Um, I, we knew we were going to have a lot of fun with this. I hadn't seen it in a long time, I actually. Well, let me get through the rigmarole first. Sure, no problem. This is a 1984 American sci-fi romantic adventure comedy film. So you got everything in there. <laughs> Directed by W.D. W. D. Richter. It stars Peter Weller, John Lithgow, Ellen Barkin, Christopher Lloyd, Vincent Scarelli, Clancy Brown, and Jeff Goldblum. A lot of star power here. <laughs> uh, yeah, it didn't do very well. Uh, you'll all figure out why soon. It uh, cost $17 million and it only made six. <sighs> yeah, I mean, and what's interesting is they just they threw everything at this film. The, like... <laughs> Well, before we get into it, you should explain why this movie is very important to us. Well, when, uh, for me, um, I'm not sure what age it happened for you. I was probably six, maybe seven. Um, our father, I, was, I think one day I was just sitting around and he was like, oh, uh, you want to watch a movie? And I was like, yeah. I was like, what do you want to watch? I said, you know, something with space or planets or something because you know, I was six. <laughs> something with planets? Yeah, I was in the so whatever. Six, you know. six years old, you said, can you can we watch a movie with planets? Like, that's a problem. <laughs> Why would you say planets? Because we were studying like the planets in school. It's first grade, sure. you know. Yeah, okay. Whatever. Well, shut up. Anyway, so <laughs> we, were, we, were, we were, and he's like, and he, he popped this in. And of course, I had no idea what was going on in the film, but there was a lot of shooting and you know, aliens, and, you know, it was just exciting as a kid to watch. And then over the years, you you know, I started to realize how different this movie is. Well, for me, I had a much different experience than you. Mm. Uh, our father is not a guy who really watches TV or watches movies. There are three movies he watches. The original Star Wars, and I mean not the original trilogy, like the first Star Wars movie. Episode four. Uh, New Hope. He watches Red Dawn. And this movie, for some reason, these are the three movies our dad watches. That's it. And he loves them. And, yeah. and he loves them. And I remember when I was a kid, I found this movie because he had a VHS tape that he had recorded three movies off of HBO in the 80s. <laughs> yep. And it was and it, it, and yeah, it the was, same, same VHS that I saw it off of. Like, yep, it was Red Dawn, what was the, uh, three, three Amigos, and this movie. That's right. And for the longest time, I didn't see The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension <laughs> on anything else but that VHS tape, and I would describe it to people, and people would look at me like I was out of my fucking mind. I've done the same thing. I've tried to explain this movie to a couple people. It, like, and, and as seeing it as, like, I didn't really know what this movie was about for about 20 years. <laughs> like, I saw it constantly, and it always didn't make any sense. And it was just like, oh, it's just a movie. I don't know what it's about or really what's going on. I, I do want to say, though, quick, just to interject. The watching this in HD gives the movie a whole new feel. Like there's stu there's stuff in there that I saw that I'm like, oh, didn't even know that was there. <laughs> First of all, before we get into it, let's just say if you everyone needs to see this, it is a see to believe it movie. You will not believe like what we're gonna say following our rigmarole here will sound like complete nonsense. <laughs> and it's a movie you have to if you really want to understand it at least three times. Oh yeah, at keep least. it yeah. You're absolutely right. Be prepared to watch it the first time and be like, I have no idea what the fuck I just saw. A lot of <laughs> words get thrown out that don't make any sense. <laughs> a lot of people, the writing in this is off the walls. The phrases people say, of which I have written all of them down. Oh, you wrote them all down? Oh, good. So, okay. Right. So we might as well get into it. All right. Ooh. Okay. So here is the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension. <laughs> so... 
we have an opening scrawl over the Buckaroo Banzai theme and the Buckaroo Banzai logo. Oh, before we start, we start, I guess we should say that Buckaroo Banzai is a man played by Peter Weller. <laughs> yeah, a.k.a. you might know him as RoboCop. Yeah, RoboCop. He's Before he was RoboCop, he was Buckaroo Banzai. Yeah. As the theme is playing, there's an opening scrawl that catches us up to who Buckaroo Banzai is. Because as you and me were discussing just a minute before we started recording, this movie starts off assuming you know who Buckaroo Banzai is and you're on board with this franchise that just started now. <laughs> yeah, they put it right in the middle. There's no origin story, none of that stuff. It's in the it's just in that the opening scroll and yeah, it does it, it's almost like the the movie has its own inside joke and you're just not a part of it. And the movie's sort of laughing at you, and for the first viewing, you're like, ah, I get it, I get <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely, it, it, you, you get thrown right into the mix. But it does establish a lot of things up front. So, <clears throat> Buckaroo Banzai, born to an American mother and a Japanese father, thus began life as he was destined to live it, going in several directions at once. A brilliant neurosurgeon, this restless young man quickly grew dissatisfied with life devout solely to medicine. He roamed the planet studying martial arts and particle physics. Collecting around him the most eccentric group of friends, those hard-rocking scientists, the Hong Kong Cavaliers. And now, with his astonishing jet car, ready for a bold assault on the dimensional barrier, Buckaroo Banzai faces the greatest challenge of his turbulent life, while high above the Earth, a alien spacecraft nervously watches on Team Banzai's every move. And if this is your first viewing, you read that and you go, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, and it's like... First off, if even if you know a little bit about the film, it's almost like saying say the saying that the the movie itself is a comic book. It's like saying, and here's issue thirty two. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> uh, here's, yeah, you, here's you, issues you, one through thirty one, and it's in this two paragraphs. <laughs> so just to, so just to say that in cliff notes, Buckaroo Banzai, the character, is the top neurosurgeon in the world, a particle physicist, a race car driver a rock star, a comic book hero, and a secret agent. Also, the types and amount of people that talk to him, it appears as if in this universe, Buckaroo Banzai is the most important person in the world. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and if anyone sees him, they're always like, oh, that's Buckaroo Banzai. It's not yet. He's the single most recognizable figure in the world. Like, if Buckaroo Banzai died, like... G global economy collapses. Yeah, and even later on we'll talk about it. Even the president is like, you know, ah, oh, Buckaroo Banzai, I'll take his advice over everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so we are at the launch pad of this jet car that he's about to test, and everyone is preparing for this rocket car to go off, which is just a Ford pickup truck an with a rocket engine. It's an F-350 with a rocket engine. <laughs> That's it. It doesn't have special tires. <laughs> It's just a fucking pickup truck with a jet engine on it. Oh, and uh, Buckaroo Banzai's not there because he's busy doing a last-minute brain surgery, an experimental brain surgery with a laser. With uh, Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum and uh, Clancy Brown, who is his, like, number two. Clancy Brown is the guy who does the voice of Mr. Krabs on SpongeBob and has been in a thousand things. What's his uh, character's name, his, like, call sign? He's Rawhide. Rawhide, that's right, yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll get to the Hong Kong Cavaliers when they come up. <laughs> and the Blue Blazer regulars, maybe. <laughs> and the Blue Blazer regulars, of course. This will all be explained. So, uh, he during the surgery, uh, he asked Jeff Goldblum to join his band. Not his band of merry men, or, like, literally his rock and his roll rock band. His rock band, yeah. And with that so, comes a lot of things. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a lot of responsibility of joining this guy's weekend night band. So, Buckaroo finally arrives at the pad. And they keep and they, at one point they say this car is supposed to go 500 miles an hour, which the Secretary of Defense thinks is impossible. So I looked it up. The year before, in 1983, the land speed record was 634 miles an hour. <laughs> so I guess they got their facts a little mixed up. So this really isn't a big deal that he's going 500 miles an hour. <laughs> but the, that's not the point. The speed, yeah, but uh, I guess they're missing the point because the speed is not really his his focus. No, he secretly is using this jet car launch to test 
his oscillation overthruster. <laughs> and what is an oscillation overthruster, Francis? It's something that allows you to pass into a piece of matter and go in between it and you go into another stopped, dimension. You could have stopped at something. It's something. <laughs> something. It's, it's kind of the MacGuffin of this movie. Yeah, but yes. it's like well, the movie is basically about an, the oscillation overthruster. Right. It's basically it's the core of an, in, an interdimensional laser that allows you to travel through solid matter into a, it's a tiny some, little. It's like saying there's a dimension, in, you know, and that's the thing. If you get you'd have to watch this movie five times at least before you figure that out. Yeah, it's just this tiny little octagon thing <laughs> that becomes like up and it's important stuff. or something. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so we get, we get all set up. He's in his rocket car. The countdown launch sequence happens. On a computer, we see a screen that's counting down, and it's testing all of the rockets, and it goes, sign, sealed, delivered. Why does the computer say sign, sealed, delivered, that the rocket car is ready? So he takes off in his rocket car, and everything's going great. Then just before he gets to the ending point, this rocket car, going 500 miles an hour, makes a 90-degree turn... <laughs> He drives directly into a mountain. He turns on the oscillation over thruster, which makes a really bad cartoon laser happen. <laughs> and then he drives through a mountain. Into another, there's another dimension inside the mountain, apparently. Yeah, the handling on this rocket car, by the way, is amazing. <laughs> yeah, he's just like, I'm going to go. He's like, and hard left. I'm going far. Hard left. It's just like, it's like you can't even do that in my car now when I'm going like 20. Yeah, I mean, and it's like, and he doesn't lose anything. He's just like, Zoop, I'm off. Nope, doesn't tell anybody anything. He turns on this laser, drives right into a mountain, and then we get to see the eighth dimension, which is made up of only the crappiest-looking 80s computer effects imaginable. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, this is one of the the great lot. He's gone through it. He's gone through the mountain. Oh, I got, I got another one. He drove right into a wall of rock. Holy shit. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So he get, so he comes out the other side of the mountain and he bails out of his car. He sees that his car is so hot his windshield wipe his windshields have melted and he climbs underneath his car. I don't know why. He climbs underneath his car and he finds that there's a little alien interdimensional creature there. It's about the size of a tangerine. It's a little sticky gooey ball. But I don't know why he crawled under his car in the first place. But that's that's entirely beside the point. That has nothing to do with our problems of this movie. <laughs> Cut to John Lithgow, who is in a mental asylum which is also kind of an apartment complex for some reason. Well, yeah, and maybe they just don't want them to feel like they're in prison. I don't know. But there's no like do there's no doctors. It's just like the attendant guy that like comes in and is like, "Here's your yeah. mail." It's just basically an apartment <laughs> complex. These people aren't allowed to leave. But they can do whatever they want because John Lithgow is, is like building a car battery. Yeah, and I think they complain about him like using too much power or something like that. Yeah, so he's he's crazy. He's got wacky hair, and he sees on TV that Buckaroo completed interdimensional travel. So now he hooks himself up to his exposition machine. All he's doing is having a memory. He's just having a flashback. But instead of having a flashback. He hooks these electrodes up to his tongue and ears, plugs it into the wall outlet, activates this switch, and he's electrocuted into having a memory. Why is he hooked up? Can't he just go, oh, back in the day? He nope, has to yeah. fucking have this exposition device connected to the wall. So in this flashback, we see this part of the movie was the first time that I was like, this doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah, I mean, when I was, I mean, it's just funny because when I watch it as a kid, you just don't think of it. You're like, oh, he's just using this to have a memory, but now you're like, why didn't he just well, have the memory? Well, not just, not just this device, this flashback. Like I told you before, you and me have seen this movie probably 30 times, and out of those 30 times, we've probably seen 15 of those together. Probably, yeah. This was the first time I sat down and actually took notes and was trying to very religiously follow the plot. This is where the movie starts to fall Are apart. Are you going to mention me. 1938? Of course you have yeah, to. I it's know. a huge scene. Yeah. So, in this flashback, we see John Lithgow, who is playing Dr. Amelia Lazardo, uh, is working with this the old Asian man who is Buckaroo's mentor and was at the jet car launch. He's his, like, co-scientist, kind of. Yeah. yeah, so, back in 1938, this old guy who now works with Buckaroo and Dr. Amelia Lazardo create the laser that Buckaroo uses in 1984, which was... 40, 46 years ago, by the way? How old is John Lithgow supposed to be? Yeah, and even if you're thinking he's like 20 
26 or 25 at the time, maybe? He'd which still be he is, 60. Which he is not. Yeah, no, but yeah, you'd say at least then he'd be like at least almost 70, you know, or whatever. He should, yeah, he should be in his 70s. He's exa- The guy hasn't aged in 46 years. <laughs> and they have no way of, they don't like explain that at all. So they, they're creating this laser back in 1938. They do a primitive test of running a train car into the wall instead of a jet car. Lizardo's head, not his whole body, goes through the portal. And inside dimension A, the eighth dimension, a bunch of aliens attack him and then possess him something. Well, I guess, yeah, it's supposed to be the leader of the... Al- this alien yes. group, which we'll talk the leader, about soon. Lord John Warfen, ruler of the Red Electroids. Yep, here we go. <laughs> possesses him. Yep. They pull Dr. Emilia Lizardo, played by John Lithgow, out of the wall, yep. and now he is possessed by the alien Lord John Warfen and runs away. Everybody following so far? Because I've seen this movie 30 times, and I'm not entirely sure that that's right. <laughs> that's right. I think you've got it. You've got it. Okay, so, so to sum it up, so basically John Warfin, who is possessing the body of Emilia Lizardo, played by John Lithgow, has been trapped on Earth for, tw- for 46 years, and now realizes he can go home since Buckaroo Banzai's laser works. He's going to steal right? it from him. Yeah, basically. Even though the laser worked... 46 years ago, and he could have gone home at any time. <laughs> well, no, he, he was stuck in a mental institution. Well, I guess he's it, free to do whatever he wants there. What do you mean he's stuck in a mental institution? When he decides he's going to break he out, just he out. just leaves. <laughs> well, we'll he get... just walks out the door. This is pointless. Uh... He says he's trapped here. He's not. <laughs> the laser is the reason he's here. It works. He could have gone home immediately. Yeah, he should, could have just gotten like, all right, we'll set that back up and do it again. Yeah, set that back up. Send me home right now. Never mind. Hunker down for a half a century. <laughs> and not age a day. And not age a day. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. <laughs> so... <laughs> He's, he, he realizes that the laser works. He's like, oh, I can go home. Home is where you wear your hat. <laughs> that's, a, that's a thing he says. It's, 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 home is where you wear your hat? Yeah. Oh, man. What does that mean? It's, well, when you're at home, it, never mind. <laughs> when you're at home, you wear your favorite hat. Yeah, that's oh, by the way, John Warfin, who's possessing uh, Dr. Emilio Lozardo, played by John Lithgow, has a really bad Italian accent. <laughs> throughout the whole movie and also he's doing like alien snarling so he's just he's not, he's a fucking cartoon character so when he's scribbling on the wall like a madman going home is where you wear your hat it's just it's it's a real treat let me and tell his, you his teeth are just straight almost black <laughs> <laughs> so the day after conducting experimental brain surgery, breaking the land speed record, but not really, and traveling <laughs> interdimensionally, Buckaroo Banzai and his band, the Hong Kong Cavaliers, are going to headline at the hottest club in New Jersey. And there's like, what, 50 people there? <laughs> uh, let's talk about the lineup of the Hong Kong Cavaliers. Oh, the names. Which in- These are great. Which include Rawhide, Reno, Nevada, Perfect Tommy, New Jersey, and Pinky Carruthers, who is also a member of Buckaroo's network of agents, the Blue Blazer Regulars. It's wait, I thought it was Blue Blazer Regulars. No, Blue Blaze Irregulars. Oh, I've always called it Blue Blazer, like the the coach. Nope, it's Blue Blaze Irregulars. Space Irregulars. So all those words I said are things that happen in this movie. Oh, man. So Buckaroo has a guitar solo and a trumpet solo. <laughs> he is he is <laughs> off the chain. Buckaroo stops the show because despite having an entire band playing next to his head, he can hear a woman crying in the audience. <laughs> that's how good he is. That's how because he is the he is the single most important person in the world and he can do everything. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. <laughs> it's yeah, he's a Mary Sue and you know what? I'm okay with him being a Mary Sue. Buckaroo Bonds is fucking the worst Mary Sue of all. There's nothing he can't do. He flies a fucking alien spaceship later. <laughs> what? It's just, you know, after you, yeah, and you just don't think about it. You watch the movie and you're like, I'm okay with it. Yeah, you're like, oh, this is fine. And then people pick up like a piece of paper off the ground. And they're like, oh, look, it's the latest issue of the Adventures of Buckaroo Bonsai comic book. I'm like, what? 
<laughs> he's everyone knows who he is. He is like, everybody. Oh, <laughs> so he, he hears the, the girl crying in the audience. Yeah, he hears the girl crying, and it's and it's uh, played by Ellen Barkin. She is paying playing Penny Pretty, who uh, had her heart broken or whatever. Blah blah blah, and she's drunk and crying. People start to mock her because she's crying in this club alone. And uh, Buckaroo goes, hey, 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 now, don't be mean. We don't have to be mean. Because remember, no matter where you go, it there works. you are. It, yeah. it, in the context of what is happening, that saying that makes no sense. And first off, it's just a, it's like a standard statement. It's like, well, you're there, so you're there. It's, <laughs> don't make fun of this crying woman. Don't be mean, because no matter where you go, there you are. Thanks, Buckaroo. He's a fucking... This guy's a con man. <laughs> just use, just say whatever, and people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Oh, He's yeah, really strong. That's right. Yeah. Buckaroo Bonsai said that. This must be important. Yeah, well, I don't know what it means, but it sounded important. So he so decides, he decides gonna, he's going to play a, what, a piano solo for her and just sing to her. To start. Yeah, he's going to play a little love ballad. Right, because now you know what he's trying to do. Cheer her up. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the middle of the song, she pulls out a gun to kill herself. A waitress bumps her. It goes off into the ceiling, and everyone thinks she's trying to kill Buckaroo, so she's arrested. Oh, the horror. Back, <laughs> back at the mental asylum, John Warfin has killed the head orderly and called Yo-Yo Dine Propulsion Systems and told them that it's time to go home. Hold on. You gotta, we can't just say Yo-Yo Dine Propulsion Systems. Why can't we? Oh, you're right, because they haven't explained anything about it yet. Yeah. He calls Yo-Yo Dine Propulsion Systems, and then he just walks out of this place. He doesn't have to break a lot. He just fucking leaves. Every, like, like he could have 46 years ago. What happened? Five people watch him murder this guy? <laughs> I'm telling you, this mental asylum is run by this one guy who is now dead. <laughs> so the Hong Kong Cavaliers go to the prison where Penny is. There they meet Jeff Goldblum, who officially joins the, the band and his scientific research group. Because every member of the band is also a genius. I don't know if we established that. I love his outfit. Why is he dressed up like a goddamn cowboy? And his what is his his um his chaps are like just furry? I don't and okay, when I say cowboy, I don't mean he's got jeans on, some cowboy no. boots, he's wearing like a Stetson. He has a fuck he looks like John Wayne from a bad 60s cowboy movie. And they never explain it ever. You know, and it fits his character. His, you know, it, it doesn't fit his character. I was going to be sarcastic, but yeah, he it, his name, his what's his nickname? New Jersey, right? New Jersey, because yeah. he's from New yeah. Jersey. And he's a cowboy. And he meets them at the police department, and he's just fucking dressed like a cowboy for no reason. I like how he's like, he's like, you told me to meet you here. I'm like, didn't? Wait, why are we meeting at a police department? Yeah, why couldn't you? Like, you guys are in a traveling bus. Couldn't you pick Jeff Goldblum up? <laughs> you know, you have to wait at the police. This police department. Also, Jeff Goldblum, meet me at the police department. Please be dressed as a cowboy. <laughs> Well, it's part of the persona. Well, well Buck Rubanzai asked that Buck Rubanzai is the single most important human being on the face of this planet, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> and <laughs> Jeff Goldblum's really good in this movie as well. Oh, he's brilliant in this movie. Jeff, Gold, Jeff Goldblum could be in every movie ever, and I'd be happy. He's brilliant. Yeah. And more Jeff Goldblum in everything, please. I agree with that. So they're there because they go to see, what Pe they go to see Penny, and, it, and Penny turns out to look exactly like... Buckaroo Banzai's dead wife, like identical. So he's like, he has well, I have weird... to love her now. He has, yeah, he has a weird fascination with her. We don't know how his wife died. Uh, so he bails Penny out of jail, and now she's just with him throughout the rest of the hold, movie. Hold I guess this woman doesn't have a job. Here's one thing I gotta say about this. I like that they're in the jail, and he, he's just like, I let her out. Yeah, and they do. And they're like, oh, well, Buckaroo Banzai said to let her out, so... So I guess we better let out this like, woman who discharged a firearm in a public venue. Yeah, there's no like, you know, well, we have to, she has to see a judge or anything. No, just let her out because Buckaroo. Because Buckaroo Banzai is the single most important person on the face of this earth. Smash cut to a press conference about the interdimensional travel. Now, hold on. Where the, yes? The press conference? It's supposed to be like there's all these joint chiefs of staff or something there and all these important people, and it's in like a hotel-like lobby, like not hotel-like yeah. conference room. Yeah, it's in like a Marriott. <laughs> it's like in a Marriott courtyard. And you've got all these important military figures and then just guys that showed up in a suit and they're allowed to be there. Like. <laughs> And so, like, it, it's been, and I mean, it makes sense that all these people would be there for the top scientists to explain what he did. Right. But on the panel is every member of his band and Penny. 
Why is Penny on the panel? <laughs> she has her own microphone. <laughs> she just met them two hours ago. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's not a scientist at all. So he's given this speech. Just when you think this movie can't get any weirder, we cut to space where a giant spaceship inhabited by interdimensional aliens known as the Black Lectroids are listening in. Now remember, we had the Red Lectroids earlier. The Red Lectroids are the bad guys, and the Black Lectroids are the good guys. And they look exactly the same. So much so that I don't even think that they're different colors. They're not. No, I don't think they're different colors. Though. Especially on that VHS recording. According from HBO, I did not know that these were supposed to be two different species of aliens. <laughs> they look exactly the same. And then, I don't know, yeah, and you've just got, the only difference is the black lectroids, when they, in their human form, are black people, and the red lectroids are white people. That's yeah. The, that's the, the difference, guess, yeah, yeah. I guess that is it. Yeah. So in the middle of the speech, someone tells uh, Buckaroo that the President of the United States is calling him, because apparently that's a thing that happens all the time. I like his reaction, too. He's like, President of what? <laughs> He's like, yeah. the President's calling the President of what? The President of the United States is like, oh. <laughs> It's like, but it's not. But it's not the president. No, it's the black electroids in space. So he picks up the payphone where the call has been routed to, and the electroids send him an electric charge through the phone, which allow him to see the electroids, and also sent him some sort of chemical formula. That he has to write down it. on his hand, right? Right, write down on his hand, and uh, that's where we see that the bad aliens with John Warfin are at this conference room disguised as humans. Because um, yeah, who's there? Christopher Lloyd's there. Well, for, first we got to say also when they do that, the black electrodes in space launch a pod to Earth. Yeah, for no reason. Oh well, there is a reason, no, but... no. It's actually a huge part yeah, of the. Movie. Yeah, I guess at the time though, you're like, <laughs> so, oh no, what Buckaroo the... Banzai <sighs> is now imbued with knowledge, right? So why did he? What is the 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 formula for? It's at the end when they're using those breathing tubes and they can all see the oh, aliens. Oh, okay, that's what that is. All right. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. So he 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 gets shocked and electrocuted. He's on the ground. He's like, oh my god, there's aliens! Quick, we got to go to the conference room. So they run to the conference room. And he sees two of the audience members are red electroids, including one of them, who is Christopher Lloyd. Buckaroo Banzai points and says, there they are. Somebody goes, there are who? And he goes, don't you see them? There, evil, pure and simple, by the way of the eighth dimension. The writing in this is fucking fantastic. <laughs> evil, pure and simple, pure. by the way of the eighth dimension. <laughs> and this is the time I'd like to say that... This movie is what, you know, I get, we get a lot of comic nerds like myself that are always like, when you see a comic book movie and you're like, you know, it wasn't like it was in the comics. This is why you don't do that. Yeah. You, because yeah. If you, because if you literally you translate shit. a movie from a comic book, this is what you get. But for some reason, this one works. <laughs> yeah. I, well, yeah, because there's no comic book. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, so, actually, there is. But more on that later. So the the red electroids again, one of whom is played by uh, Christopher Lloyd, kidnap the Asian professor, uh, profession Professor Kita. They put him in a van. They drive away. Buckaroo chases them on a motorcycle. Cut to the woods where the pod we saw launch from space crashes on the ground as two hunters see it. The red electroids who just escaped, they're in the van. They detect that this crashed pod and they go to intercept it. The hunters poke it with a stick. It falls out of a tree. They think it's a dinosaur for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why that they're convinced that this thing is a dinosaur. Well, it had wings when they shot it. But now it's just a big round ball. <laughs> Maybe the wings fell off. I don't know. And, and as soon as it's rolling towards them, they're like, shoot it, shoot it. Even though it just looks like a rock. <laughs> and so uh, an alien who is a black guy with dreadlocks comes out of the top immediately slips, falls, lands on his head, and dies. <laughs> he didn't make it very far in this film. I don't understand why that's even in the movie. Why does that I happen think at all? it's used as a distraction for... You could... It's Francis, it's a movie. You can write anything you <laughs> want in it. And apparently, for the most part, they did. <laughs> All they have to do is just have the the other guy sneak out. Why does one have to come out and die? As soon as he dies and the hunters are looking at him, a second guy sneaks out and runs away. And he's identical. He's wearing the same clothes as the first guy, has the same dreadlocks, except this guy has a mustache. <laughs> and these are the it's... black lectroids, lectroids right? 
These are the black electroids, the good guys. Oh, so man. that that black electroid escapes from the pod. The red electroids show up, and they say it's a failed crash from their company that they work for, Yo-Yo Dine Propulsion System. Buckaroo is trying to find them. He contacts Rawhide and says he's got to come pick them up because he's unable to find electroids. Rawhide tells, the prof- uh, tells him the professor was kidnapped. And as soon as uh, Buckaroo hears that the professor's kidnapped, he says, the deuce, you say. The deuce, you say. What does that mean? <laughs> the, deuce, the deuce, you say. <laughs> so Buckaroo Banzai eventually gets to the crash site. He breaks into the van. He rescues the professor and helps the professor escape. We should also mention at this point that Buckaroo can't touch anyone. Because he's shot because, him, yeah. <laughs> because he's been, quote, ionized and electrocutes anyone he touches. <laughs> Is this where he gives the professor the formula? <laughs> Yeah, he he has the formula written down on his hand, and he got, he to give the professor the formula, he licks his palm and then sticks it to the professor's head. So now the formula is imprinted on the professor's forehead. When you were a kid, didn't you used to say something about this part? <laughs> he sh- he holds up his palm to the old to the professor and he goes, "What is this?" And the professor goes, "Does your hand buckle?" <laughs> <laughs> because it's a little joke. But when I was a little kid, any time my dad was like, we're crossing the street or something, he'd go, give me your hand, Bakaru. <laughs> oh, okay. That's right. <laughs> I knew there was something with that line. <laughs> give me your hand, Bakaru. The, I was saying lines from this movie before I even saw this movie because of dad. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, how many times do he, he would just be like, oh, Saturday afternoon, not doing anything. Let's Always watch. wear you wear your hat. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, back to the movie. So... <laughs> So the professor escapes back at the Buckaroo Command Center. <laughs> Perfect. It's killing me, dude. I can't even deal with this. <laughs> at the Command Center, Perfect Tommy contacts the local Blue Blazer regulars to help them save Buckaroo. Uh, and so this is a. So this is just like you're almost like an on call type thing, like a fan club yeah. kind of. <laughs> well, no, it's almost like they're like part time agents or like reserve agents. Like, any time Buckaroo is in trouble anywhere in the world, he can contact the local Blue Blazer regular, and they'll come help him. Yeah, and I, I, apparently there's no age, you know, requirement for it. Oh, no, because the person they call is a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> <laughs> and his, his, his room is just filled with Buckaroo, you know. He's wearing a Buckaroo Bonsai baseball cap. <laughs> and it's almost like he just sits at this, at this chair and waits for a call from the, from the Blue Blazer regulars. So, meanwhile, at the crash, the red electroids try to break into the ship, so a third one who's inside uh, is given the order to kill himself because he failed. Now that's, and, uh, the, they black, there's a black electroid in the th- inside the pod, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so he sets the self-destruct. Buckaroo witnesses this attempted break-in, gets caught, flees as the pod explodes, and then gets rescued by a 12-year-old boy in a helicopter. Well, he, I like when he gets caught, like... um. I forget which. Well, I, we also didn't mention that all the red electroids. Every actually, every electroid. Their first name is John. Yes, John uh, Smallberries. Yeah, yeah. John John Yaya. John Big Booty. <laughs> it's Big Booty. John Many Jars. Many Jars. John Little John. John. Ma- <laughs> Little John. John Parker. John Warfin. They're all John for some reason. Now, <laughs> when he catches them, he kicks. John O'Connor, this bad guy, in the nuts. And runs away in fear. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I didn't even think of that until you just said it. Buck Rubanzai, who's supposed to be the greatest man ever, gets caught, kicks a man in the nuts, runs away, and then gets rescued by a child. <laughs> I know. You're like, is the kid driving the helicopter? <laughs> He's the one making the announcements, because when the, the helicopter lays down, the kid is speaking through a megaphone. <laughs> so we, So he escapes. So now we're back at the Buckaroo Banzai headquarters. The professor gets there, and they're doing research on yo-yo dine propulsion systems. The alien that escaped from the pod, named John Parker, who, who is a good guy, the black guy with the dreadlocks, who uh, for some reason also has a Jamaican accent. All the black electroids have Jamaican accents what from it? space. <laughs> I don't know. I... Don't, don't, know what, don't know what's going on there. He shows up, he talks to Pinky Carruthers, and gives him a package for Buckaroo. So then we cut to the research room, and through a series of logical leaps that never entirely become clear, they figure out that the aliens landed on Earth in 1938, hypnotized Orson Welles to make the War of the Worlds broadcast and make everybody think it was a hoax to cover it up. 
Got it? <laughs> well, you know, it's, yeah, because Jeff Goldblum said it was. <laughs> because, ba- honestly, yeah, that's pretty much what happened. He, co- he's like, Jeff he doesn't take any time to figure it out. He's just like, oh, oh, yeah, I mean, uh, think about it. Uh, just, War of the Worlds. Just uh, there, <laughs> he's just sitting there rubbing his face going, don't you get it? 1938, War of the Worlds. So they came here and they did this and blah, blah, blah. And we're all like, I guess? <laughs> oh, I, and even some of the... Even some of the bonsai guys, the the uh, Hong Kong Cavaliers, are like, "What? Sure, I guess. Like, I, no one else has an idea. Let's go with that one." <laughs> yeah. Which actually, I don't know. I kind of find a kind. Wow, I kind of find that uh, an interesting plot twist. It's just like it was done but, so but quickly. But they, they never play with no, it. Oh, that's it. Yeah, it just they can't. That's how the, they had to have a reason for them to all be on Earth. But it's completely unrelated to John Warfens. He came through a portal in 1938 in a basement in New Jersey, and then they're saying these aliens came from space in 1938 on Halloween. What... Why not have everybody come with the, Why are there so many different plot points? It doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, we've been trying to figure this out for, what, 20-something years now? Oh, 20, oh, at least 20 years we've been trying to put this together, and only now are we sort of scratching the surface. Huh? So the red electroids break into Buckaroo's complex because they're looking for the oscillation overthruster. Buckaroo finally shows up. They open the package that John Parker bought, and it's a hologram message from uh, the leader of the Black Electroids, who is a Jamaican woman named John. John, uh, um, I forget what her name is. Her last name. Irrelevant. Basically, John Warfin, so, and she gives this whole expositionary speech that basically John Warfin, who is Dr. Emilio Lizardo, played by John Lithgow, <laughs> was a Hitler-type character on Planet 10, but was overthrown and then banished to the Eighth Dimension. Some of his... Uh, compatriots escaped and made it to Earth slash John Lithgow got possessed and now they want Buckaroo Banzai's oscillation overthruster so they can return to the 8th dimension, get all of the rest of their uh, their army, then go back to planet 10 and take over again, even though this laser was working in 1938 and we could have done that in the first place. Well, and I don't understand is... That, <laughs> Anything why? I just said? Why? I just thought of this. Why did John Warfin even possess Emilio um, Lazardo in the first place? Like I've been saying that the whole time. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And then he's like, but I'm going to go back to the eighth dimension. Why? They're in prison there. How are you going to get out? He's going to go to the eighth dimension to get the rest of his army so that they can come back to this dimension and invade planet 10 and take it over. And I love... I love the black electroids are like, hey, you're going to help us or else we're going to start World War Three. <laughs> and by because, by the way, Cold War is kind of going on. <laughs> yeah, it's 1984. One might say the Cold War is kind of going yeah. on. <laughs> so they, but their, their plan is if you don't do this, we're going to fire a laser at the USSR and, and start World War Three. <laughs> so when they say, if you don't do this, we're going to start World War Three. So it'll destroy the world and essentially John Warfin. Why don't they just fire a laser at John Warfin and kill him? <laughs> and just be done with it. Why, why do they have to get so involved in the politics of this planet that they're not from and basically end its war- end the life of everything on it because this one dude is pissing them off? And I love how they're, they're – they are – again, so not only is Buck Rubanze the most important part of the planet, person on the planet, he might be the most important person in the universe. Oh, yeah. Every alien knows him per- by name. They've probably been collecting the comic books for a few years. Like they like they turn on <laughs> they turn on this hologram and it goes, Ah, hello, Buckaroo Banzai, the greatest man ever. <laughs> Great. And fucking but Peter Weller's just standing there going, yes, yes. yes mm-hmm. Continue. Um, usually people kneel when they talk to me, but... <laughs> to, to the great buckaroo. Uh, what a fucking stupid name, by the way. <laughs> fucking buckaroo. We're going to name this our kid so, buckaroo. This is so dumb. Know, really? So uh, Penny and buckaroo have a weird discussion where we find out that she secretly has an identical twin sister and is Buck, who was Buckaroo's dead wife. That is a thing that goes nowhere. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of there for a second, and they're like, well, I love you, so who cares? To be perfectly honest with you, why is she in this movie? You have to have the <laughs> female. She doesn't do anything. Um, <laughs> she, do- she causes she does a lot not- of trouble. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, the, the red electroids are now inside the main complex. They find the professor. They chase him as he's trying to escape with the oscillation overthruster. Also, we learn that the uh, red electroids can spit out little poisonous spiders that attach to you and kill you. Yeah, they poison uh, you and you die. Yeah. Buckaroo and the gang uh, find out that the professor is on the run, so they split up to, throughout the facility to try and find him. Rawhide gets hit by a spider, and everybody goes, oh, no, we love Rawhide. Uh, also, Jeff Goldblum and Reno Nevada are sneaking around trying to see if they can find anybody. Jeff Goldblum sees a watermelon on the table and goes, why is that watermelon there? And Reno Nevada goes, I'll tell you later. And he never tells him, why is there a watermelon there? No. This watermelon is like in a fucking hydraulic press. <laughs> Maybe for a test, I don't know. And they just walk right by it. So the professor's trying to escape, and he runs into Penny in the basement. Uh, he's on. They're they're separated by like a like a metal gate, mm -hmm. and so he takes the oscillation over thruster out of his box and hands it to Penny underneath, and she runs away. Worst Which idea ever, a, I guess. She because has she to. gets kidnapped right away. Two seconds later, I have to fill that uh, damsel in distress trope. She turns a corner and she's kidnapped. <laughs> <laughs> good job, Penny. You really did a good one there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we uh, John Parker finally shows up and says that he's a good guy. Well, he got captured. Uh, they they tried yeah, to... Pinky Carruthers captured yeah. him. Blue Blazer regular Pinky Carruthers. They bring him out and he goes, "I'm a good guy." And uh, Rawhide dies, and it's very sad. Actually, not really. <laughs> These just kind of. I mean, they're sad, but they're kind of like. Well, I mean, they they they, they like yeah, uh, I know. Perfect but... Tom, perfect Tommy's uh, pushing his emotions down because he's perfect, so he's not going to yeah, cry. Yeah, that's the whole thing about per they they portray that he's the perfect man. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Perfect Tommy is perfect, yeah. which I don't know how he can exist as being perfect in a world where Buckaroo Banzai is the most important man. He's got the perfect body, perfect hair, perfect whatever else. <laughs> so Buckaroo Banzai calls the president, who for some reason that I can only discern as an artistic choice is suspended in midair on a giant wheel. Well, he's got a back problem. Why write that into the movie, yeah. though? I also like that when he calls them, it's uh, through Skype, apparently. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's a futuristic video phone that did not exist in 1984. But, so, uh, so he basically just lays on the, the alien invasion onto the president. And what I love about this scene, he's like, sir, there's aliens. They've been here for a while. They're the member that they run Yo-Yo Dine propulsion systems. And uh, the secretary of defense is just angry that Yo-Yo Dine is run by foreigners. <laughs> right. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, he's like, they're building <laughs> they're our like, bomber. <laughs> yeah, the president's like, aliens? He's like, foreigners? <laughs> So then they get NORAD on the phone, and they go, Sir, NORAD says all of our communication satellites are jammed. And the president goes, By who, who, by? By who, who, by? By who, who, by? <laughs> That's right. By who, who, by? <laughs> so uh, Buckaroo prepares the Hong Kong Cavaliers and a select group of Blue Blaze regulars to invade Yo-Yo Dine propulsion systems to rescue Penny and get back the oscillation overthruster. That's a sentence I oh get to say. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Buckaroo takes the rocket car to Yo-Yo Dine because they think Buckaroo Banzai still has the oscillation overthruster because I guess they just didn't go through Penny's purse. Or well, I think they think some... it's bigger. No, no I don't. You don't think so? I don't know because don't you know what's his know. name? Um, because John Warfin has one and it's like enormous. <laughs> But it's missing the circuit, which is what she has. Oh, that's right. Yep. That's the circuit that makes the whole thing run. I see. So uh, Buckaroo g gets there. John Warfin is in the middle of giving an in inspirational speech with great lines such as, Character is what you are in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, you know this line, so you just, uh, you just play along. Where are we going? Planet 10. When? Real soon. <laughs> Real soon. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like the way they, yeah, they're just the reaction, it really soon, or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> really soon. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> so, they realize that Buckaroo doesn't Hist have the Oh, the other line you missed is, history is made at night. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that, oh, that's those two lines. History is made at night, character is what you are in the dark. <laughs> So they realize he doesn't have the oscillation overthruster. They hook him up to some weird electronic shocking machine where they're going to get him to complete the equations. For the so circuit, they can, yeah. Yeah, for the circuit. Meanwhile, Penny is tied up in a basement, covered in honey, and a giant alien slug is slowly making its way to kill her? Eat her face and poison her, I'm guessing. Something. They never explain what this thing will do. And of course, this is in the pit. 
the, the pit, which is just a leaky basement. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, the strike team shows up. We do a lot of sneaking around. They get found out, and then an alarm goes off. Uh, they also start a gunfight, killing a lot of red electrons. I love how the red elect. Well, they have their spinning thing, but I guess they don't have guns, so they. But they're, if, what, it's funny too because like they're aliens, but they're all wearing like finely tailored suits. <laughs> So they're, like, running around through this muck and shit, but they have, like, a Windsor knot tie on. <laughs> yeah, nice slacks, good shoes. Yeah, like, nice shoes, and it's just, like, it's. it would be creepier if maybe they weren't dressed like my dad. <laughs> you know, and I've... I I, I like... I wish uh, Christopher Lloyd's character had a bigger part in this. This is a pretty big ensemble cast. Yeah, it's I mean, hard to stand to, out, yeah. It's hard to cram everybody in uh, here. We I could mean, have made the movie Jeff- longer. Uh, it's already like two hours long. <laughs> so amidst all this panic, Buckaroo escapes and uses this tracking device he has to find the overthruster and Penny. They find her, save her from the slug, but the red electroids are about to launch their secret giant massive spaceship they've been building for 46 years, I guess. And still haven't gotten it right, apparently. <laughs> no. And basically now they realize they have like mere minutes to escape before World War Three is about <laughs> to start. So uh, John Warfin's just like, I will just use the overthruster anyway, even though it doesn't, bo- it's broken, <laughs> which is like the worst plan. <laughs> they get all in this, uh, they get in this ship. John Parker and Buckaroo show up as the ship is being boarded. They fight a bunch of electroids. Both of them sneak onto a smaller pod aboard the main ship. Warfin launches the troop ship. And his overthruster doesn't work, mm-hmm. so instead of passing through the wall into the eighth dimension, he crashes through it to the other side of this building, which is just New Jersey. <laughs> and he also, right about this time, is he shoots uh, Christopher Lloyd's character and kills him. Yeah, because Christopher Lloyd's character is being a real stick in the mud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. they, de- they detach Bonsai's pod because they figure he'll just fall to his death, but he figures out how to fly it. Because he can literally do anything, I guess. In ten seconds, he figures out how to fly an alien spaceship. <laughs> because he, his, by his reasoning, the thing drives like a truck. This is impossible. <laughs> there is no way this thing that can go in infinite directions drives like a truck. That he fl- he figures out how to fly this ship. He figures out that the, the ship has a laser on it. Uh, they follow the troop ship and they blow it up with a laser beam. Warfin is dead, and now for some reason, Buckaroo Banzai descends to Earth on a parachute. It had, I guess they just had one in the alien space vessel. <laughs> I guess cut to a space where the black electroids turn off the particle beam and prepare to leave. So, so, Buck, so Buckaroo returns to the bus where Penny is. They kiss, and the movie, the main story of the movie ends. As they're kissing, the screen fades to black. We cut back to space where a black electroid goes... So what? Big, Big deal. deal. Why does he say that? I think they um they help him bring her back to life because she had died. She had she's not dead. She's not dead. She had died, and yeah, she was dead. Remember, because he goes back on the bus, and Jeff Goldblum's like, "I did all I could." Oh, that's right. Okay, so she's dead. He kisses her, and they and shock. They, to... they make him shock her. So what? The aliens are like, "We can bring back the dead. It's no biggie." Yeah, you've got it. That's why he said yeah. that. I just learned that now. And we're learning stuff every time we watch this movie. <laughs> this is so the the end of the movie the as the after so what the big deal cut to black best part coming out up. out of the distance <laughs> out of the distance in the way far beyond words rapidly approach the screen that says uh, the to watch the upcoming film Buckaroo Banzai versus the World Crime League that movie never came out. <laughs> Mostly because the company went bankrupt. <laughs> Probably because this movie had like a $15 million deficit. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think MGM owns it now, the rights to Buckaroo Banzai. I think they do too, but this was a huge bomb and the studio went bankrupt immediately after this, due in part to this film. There was, so, a, lot of the mar- there was a lot of marketing mistakes done for this film as well. It probably would have done better. Was, well, clearly, because nobody went to see it. It was only advertised in, like, basically the Star Trek fans, comic book. They, they put the ads in comic book. Um, well, I mean, where, like, in in today, it's funny, because today, you could make a movie like this, and it would do well. And they have. It's called Guardians of the Galaxy. Exactly. Guardi- Guardians of the Galaxy is basically this movie. 
But in 1984, there was nothing like that. So when this movie came out, I can imagine a lot of people going like, I don't even know what that movie is. I'm not going to go see it. And there was a stigma to that sort of stuff back then, too. Now, if you say, hey, I'm going to go see the newest Marvel movie or any oh, sci-fi, and people are like, yeah, me too. You know, but, exactly. yeah, but back like, then people were like, yeah, that's really, really dorky. But, yeah. I mean, I, I know there's all these rumors and everything about trying to bring this movie franchise back and trying to bring this character back. But, like, I don't know. This is very, very much of its time. And you could you could never you could never remake what this encapsulates about. I don't even know what this is about. I like it would confuse it. It confuses like a lot of people. Even if they see the movie for the first time, it confuses them, and they're not interested. They're kind of like I don't yeah. even know what's going on. So why should I show any interest in it? I mean, but there there is one last thing. This movie ends when the credits start to roll after we, everybody tells us to oh. go see this great new movie that's going to come out next summer. You're going to go see it? I am. And then we have the credits where all of the members of the Hong Kong Cavaliers, a few select Blue Blazer regulars, and of course Buckaroo Banzai himself, walk in unison in a dry L.A. aqueduct to the Buckaroo Banzai ending theme. And here's a quick taste of that. song is so fucking catchy. And, but, and I love it. It's like you said, the Hong Kong Cavaliers and Blue Blazer regulars, including the dead ones. Yeah. Well, you're like, yeah. Well, um, Rawhide shows up and you're like, didn't he die like an hour ago? Oh, they, they changed this. Somebody had changed that there's a change in like he was not dead or something. I don't want to get into all that, but. Yeah, that's not like, like I said, yeah. that's not in the movie. Look, like there's all <sighs> these. If you get this on DVD, there is a DVD special feature where it's just pages and pages of backstory to this movie that's not in the movie it should have been the first movie yes it should have you're absolutely right this should have set up like who the fuck the hong kong cavaliers are like you have to figure all of this out from watching it through several times throughout your childhood you, this the thing is this was supposed to be a huge franchise like they were gonna really make this is gonna be like the new thing like you're gonna throw like a new robocop or a new like alien you know what i mean a new huge Thing. They're going to get, you know, uh, action figures, comic books, all that stuff, and videos. And it fell right on its face. Yeah, and it just never took, I mean, and, cause, and it's crazy. You look at the star power in the movie, and it's, it's like, unbelievable. <laughs> so, uh, our rating system, we'll, go, we'll give this movie a rating, is, one, you didn't hate it. It's a good party movie, it's a good hangover movie, or you hated it. Francis, give us your review and your wrap-up. Well, well, I didn't hate it. Actually, I kind of, I love it. I mean, maybe it's just the nostalgia speaking. I, I watched the movie this morning. I loved it. Again, I didn't hate it. Um, and it actually made me want to actually buy some uh, Buckaroo Banzai memorabilia and items. <laughs> <laughs> um, the movie's great. Um, John Lithgow steals the show. Peter Weller's pretty good in it, considering what he's supposed to be. He does everything. He is everything that the character is supposed to be. And I just love the quirkiness of it. And I love how it is just a comic book on the screen, even though we're getting, you know, issue 32. It's it's basic. You're watching like an outrageous either 80s uh, cartoon or comic book, something like that. So, yeah, I I love this movie. This movie encapsulates all three of our good ratings. This is, I, I certainly didn't hate it. It is a good party movie. I will say it's a good hangover movie with the stipulation of this is at least the third time you've seen it. You can't watch it the first time with a hangover. You... If you're if you're hungover and you're like, I'll give Buckaroo Banzai a try, you will be so fucking lost. You'll be lost the first time you see it if you're stone cold sober sitting in a room with nothing but Buckaroo Banzai playing. <laughs> Never mind, like, kind of hungover and maybe still a little drunk. Give the, Watch it two times and then it's a good hangover movie. But it's amazing. I mean, I can't even... This movie is so off the walls bananas. Every time I watch it, literally every time I find something new that just is entertaining or confusing or mm -hmm. funny or shocking or just it's it's all over the place it it it's the gift that keeps on giving yeah i mean and the characters i wish again there was more to it i wish the whole thing and maybe when i get these comic books and books some couple of these novels and stuff i hope that they flesh out some of the you know the characters that uh, are with them 
Oh, I'm sure they will. The secret files of uh, Pinky Carruthers. Man, I, yeah, I, yeah that, that's one thing I'm looking forward to. Actually, Perfect Tommy kind of is the most interesting, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Jeff Gold. I'm a New Jersey fan myself. But <laughs> let's uh, let's say thank you, everybody, for sticking around for 50 episodes. Thanks, there are There are some people who are actually appear to be dedicated fans, and we really honestly do appreciate that. Uh, you will also notice we have a new cover art and a new little thumbnail thing that I had commissioned, and it looks really cool. And our little hot dog character is like a little happy cartoon man. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we'll hopefully do this for another 50, and we'll stick around. Uh, you guys definitely hit us up with stuff. We enjoy hearing from you guys. We enjoy hearing what you think of the movies and what we said and movies that you think we should watch. So if you want to send that to us, send us a message at Facebook. If you don't like us on Facebook, please do. It's This Movie Was a Hot Dog. Uh, if you get this on Podomatic or iTunes, please rate and review and subscribe. It really does help the show, despite the fact that we have several robots who apparently like the show. <laughs> uh, we have a YouTube channel, uh, Zach, uh, Zach Hot Dog, Zach Space Hot Dog. It's where we have all of our um, uh, podcasts up on there, so if you, that's easier way for you to listen. Subscribe to that, comment there. We'll check all that stuff out, too. Uh, we have an email. If you want to send us an email for some reason, uh, it's uh, moviehotdog at gmail.com. Other than that, thanks everybody for sticking around for 50. I'm done speaking. And for Reverend Zach, I'm Francis, and also for the Bonsai Institute, this movie was a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs>